Okay, everyone, uh, good morning. Um, my name is Parag Pathak, and um, I'm very excited to, to be here. I actually was a student in the summer school uh, back in 2006, so it's a treat to be on the other side of the aisle here telling you about uh, a new uh, set of issues that we're going to talk about in this summer school, having to deal with matching market and issues on um, matching market design. So the structure of the next four lectures uh, today this morning, I'm going to introduce some uh, very basic uh, theoretical ideas from uh, the literature on matching markets. Uh, following that, Nikhil Agrawal is going to talk about some empirical issues. Uh, and uh, in particular, he's going to discuss how to do revealed preference analysis in uh, matching models. Um, so that's uh, more closely related to some of the ideas that we saw earlier in the, the course. Um, and then um, tomorrow we're going to extend some of those ideas in different directions and kind of consistent with the theme of this course, we're going to be talking about a mix of theory and uh, empirical issues. So um, stop me at any time. I'd love to get any questions. Uh, this is going to be really a helicopter tour of uh, many issues and um, um, let me get right into it. Okay. So you know, one of the first questions uh, that you have to ask yourself as a design economist is, why is it necessary to design uh, a market? Okay, and uh, a, a very closely related question to that is, uh, what instruments does a designer have uh, at his disposal? Okay, these are uh, very deep questions, uh, questions that I cannot do justice to, that probably merit summer schools of the <laughs> by themselves. Uh, but I think it's useful to set the stage a little bit by talking about one of my favorite examples of uh, a design problem. And uh, that is uh, what's shown in this picture here. Okay, so this is a picture of uh, <coughs> uh, an allocation mechanism that was uh, devised in the United States. Um, this was uh, in the late 1800s. The president of the U.S., Benjamin Harrison, thought it was a good idea to reclaim about two million acres of land from uh, the natives. And the scheme that uh, was adopted was uh, a scheme where uh, at high noon in the spring of 1889, um, settlers were asked to stand behind a line, uh, a gun was uh, shot, and whoever claimed a, a plot of land first was able to uh, get to that, was able to obtain that, that plot of land. Um, and so when you see a scheme like this, you can't help but ask, uh, is there a better way? Uh, and a couple of years after the Oklahoma experience, Georgia actually used a centralized mechanism, a more centralized mechanism, uh, with lotteries. Okay? Um, and as far as I know, auctions have never been used to allocate uh, land uh, like this. And um, what I hope this case uh, study uh, uh, illustrates is some resource allocation problems are designs. Folks are making decisions about how uh, um, resources are going to be designed. And they often don't use all available instruments. Okay, so well, prices in particular were not used here. Uh, this was a queuing uh, based mechanism. And there are many other examples of uh, uh, markets where explicit prices are not used. So uh, in um, several countries we have uh, forced conscription or lottery based systems for military service. Uh, in the US, green cars are allocated through a, a lottery system as is uh, jury duty. And uh, kind of the starting point for the mechanisms I want to talk about is always this question, why aren't we using prices? Okay. Um, and one set of arguments about why prices are not uh, directly used uh, has to deal with the trade-off between um, willingness to pay of agents and the ability to pay uh, of agents. Uh, so roughly speaking, the argument is uh, if we have a priced or market-based allocation system, um, then that's going to allow for preferences to be uh, expressed, willingness to pay to be expressed. Uh, but if a market clearing price is used, then income is going to play a large role. Those who have the ability to pay will um, dominate the allocation. On the other hand, if we don't use a, a price-based uh, system and use some form of rationing, uh, that may be preferred if we're concerned about equity, if we want to meet true needs. Um, the potential pitfall of a, a rationing-based scheme is uh, we may be delivering goods to those who do not really value uh, the items. So uh, we satisfy um, <coughs> the constraint about ability to pay, but we may be misallocating uh, in terms of willingness to pay. So this is a fairly loose discussion. It's a, a, an idea that's been 
formalized in several generations, uh, I think starting with uh, Marty Weitzman in uh, a very early article and made more modern with the tools of mechanism design um, in this last article by Yun Ku Che and co-authors. Other arguments that we often see involve things like technological constraints. It's hard to compute price-based equilibrium or enforcement constraints. If we buy and sell organs, does that mean when I declare bankruptcy, the courts can take a claim on my kidney? Do I have to declare that? Um, and then uh, another set of issues that are often described as moral, in quotes, or repugnance constraints. You know, our starting point is we like prices uh, in the literature on matching markets, uh, but sometimes they are not used or cannot be used. So let's try to understand what we can say in a set of models uh, without prices. Okay, and so that's going to be my agenda uh, for the lecture today. Uh, I'm going to introduce several key canonical uh, mechanisms in markets where there's indivisibilities and prices uh, may not exist, okay? And uh, we'll be um, building on these mechanisms in the subsequent uh, lectures. So the five basic ideas I want to tell you about, um, the first uh, involves uh, what I call a serial dictatorship. Um, so we're going to start from the simplest possible allocation problem and then make uh, the model increasingly more complex. Uh, the second key idea is uh, top trading cycles. So um, <clears throat> then we'll talk about stable mechanisms or the literature on um, deferred acceptance. Uh, the fourth uh, area is uh, the literature on the Boston mechanism or what's now known as the immediate acceptance uh, algorithm. And then uh, lastly, and I'm not sure I'm going to have time, uh, is an effort to try to link uh, some of these models uh, in matching to models uh, in auction theory. So. Let me get into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to make sure I understand, when you say no prices, does it always mean that we don't have about how to be done about the price? Uh, that's right. Yeah. So, I'm thinking about uh, today uh, one shot allocation problems um, where uh, there's a centralized mechanism and um, um, there's no resale uh, afterwards. Um, and um, <coughs> uh, that'll become clearer when I show you a specific so example. Yeah, so that so that's right. Uh, uh, the um, uh, well, there there is no no price, uh, and um, the you know the very first example. Maybe this will become clear as I tell you. So why don't I tell you this, and then we can come back to this. You know, what it really means to say no prices is actually quite a subtle issue. So I, I want to uh, take your point on that. Um, and um, let me uh, tell you about this very first model, okay? And um, this is uh, uh, what's known in the literature as the house allocation uh, model. So interestingly, matching theory often talks about these uh, um, canonical models of house allocation, marriage, and college. Uh, all of life's important decisions. So in the house allocation problem, our setting is we have a finite number of houses and we have a finite number of agents, okay? Uh, in the model, we will say agents have strict preferences over houses, okay? And each agent wants at most one house. And an allocation here is going to be a function, a matching that specifies each agent's assignment uh, such that no house is assigned to more than one agent. So this is the simplest possible uh, allocation problem you can uh, entertain. And uh, in this uh, environment, a, a very natural mechanism is uh, a serial dictatorship. Okay, so what is a serial dictatorship? Uh, we have an ordering of agents. Um, given that ordering of agents, um, we assign the first agent his top choice, uh, the next agent his uh, top choice among remaining houses, uh, the third agent is assigned his top choice uh, among remaining houses, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is like a queue. Um, if we think about a serial dictatorship as a direct mechanism, it has uh, some very nice properties. Uh, the first property is that it is strategy proof. Okay, what does that mean? That means it is weakly dominant uh, for agents to report their preferences uh, truthfully to the mechanism. Okay, why is that? Well, if I am uh, participating in this mechanism, I cannot influence the uh, order, the serial order by my report, right? That's just given uh, in this mechanism. And when it's my turn, I can do no better than telling the mechanism what I want uh, uh, truthfully, because uh, if it's available, that's what I will get, okay? 
Second property that this mechanism has is that it is Pareto efficient. Okay, that is, there is no other assignment, no other allocation, where some agent is getting something strictly better and no agent is getting something worse. Okay? And that's also uh, quite simple to see. Suppose uh, the allocation were Pareto inefficient. We find the first agent who is getting something different in the Pareto dominating allocation. And uh, you can see that um, since he's the first agent to get something different, when it's his turn to choose, uh, the house that he prefers was available under the serial dictatorship, so there's no way uh, there could have been someone who's getting something um, uh, that's better. Um, okay, so this is the simplest possible mechanism. Um, the variants of this mechanism that we often see in the field uh, typically involve uh, some kind of randomization. Uh, so that leads us to what's called a random serial dictatorship. So what do we do in a random serial dictatorship? We draw the ordering of agents randomly. Okay, uh, say there's a uniform uh, uh, distribution from which we draw uh, agents, and uh, that uh, mechanism uh, is going to be um, strategy proof as well, uh, random serial dictatorship. Okay, so that is um, uh, another term to tell you about. Now let's enrich the model in one direction, okay? Let's take our house allocation problem and add endowments, okay? Suppose we start the model with agents having uh, endowments. Um, and that's what leads to what we call the house, housing market model, okay? Uh, and um, you can think of our first problem, the house allocation problem, as a situation where the houses are collectively owned by society, whereas in a housing market problem, we will have the same set of primitives, houses, agents, and the new ingredient is everyone starts off endowed with a particular house, okay? Um, now, everything else is as before. So the housing market uh, model is the simplest possible exchange economy, okay? Um, and uh, as soon as we introduce uh, uh, an exchange economy, this raises the question that was asked earlier, what do we mean by absence of prices? So we could define a competitive equilibrium uh, concept here. Uh, we need not do that. Um, and some of the ideas that we want to explore for the housing market problem when we have endowments uh, involve um, individual rationality. So if we start the model with agents with endowments, uh, it may be desirable to ensure that agents are uh, doing at least as well as their starting point. Um, so that's what we mean by individual rationality here. Uh, another concept is the core. Okay, so the core is uh, uh, the idea that there is no coalition of agents who prefer to contract amongst themselves than uh, their outcome um, uh, in the housing uh, markets uh, um, solution concept. Okay. Uh, so, can we compute a core outcome? And uh, that's the question I want to talk about next. Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, and that leads us to the second very important mechanism that I want you to know about. Uh, and this is called the top trading uh, cycles algorithm. So, the, the literature actually calls this Gale's top trading cycles algorithm uh, because this uh, algorithm um, first appeared in an article by Shapley and Scarf in, in 1974. And um, you know, what they say in that article, the history of this is they were interested in this very simple exchange economy setting and uh, whether we could find a core outcome. Uh, and uh, Gale came up with this method to do this. Okay, so this is why, even though Gale didn't write the paper, it's called Gale's Top Trading Cycles Algorithm. How does this work? Okay, so uh, what we're trying to do at a very high level is look for swaps or exchanges between agents uh, in the market. Okay, uh, so uh, these are going to be organized as top cycles, or agents are going to be trading, uh, first trying to trade their top choices. So uh, in the algorithm, in step one, each agent is going to point to the owner of his favorite house. Okay. Um, <clears throat> since this is a finite model, uh, there is at least one cycle. So I'm pointing to Eric, because I would like the house that he's endowed with. Uh, Eric is pointing uh, back to me, because he would like the house that I'm endowed with, uh, that's a cycle. Okay? Um, when we find a cycle, uh, we implement the cycle. So I trade with Eric. Um, I'm assigned Eric's house and Eric is assigned uh, my house. And then we leave the problem. Okay? Now in step one, there can be cycles involving one agent. If the house uh, that I'm endowed with ends up being, say, my top choice, I'm just going to point to myself. Uh, cycles can involve uh, uh, more than two agents. There can be uh, 
uh, more than one uh, cycle in a given step. Um, <clears throat> but each agent is at, in, a, in at most one cycle uh, in any given step here. Okay, so what we do after the conclusion of step one, we remove all of these top cycles. Um, if there is at least one remaining agent, we'll proceed with the next step. So in the generic step, uh, every remaining agent is going to point to the owner of his favorite house among the remaining houses. Every agent uh, in a cycle is assigned the house of the agent he points to and is removed from the market with his assignment. Um, and we continue so long as there is one uh, agent remaining. Okay. Um, so this is uh, TTC, and uh, like a serial dictatorship, TTC has some very nice uh, properties. Okay, so let me tell you uh, a little bit about those properties. So the first uh, property is that the outcome of top trading cycles uh, is going to be a core outcome, and in this model it is the unique core outcome. Okay, so we have a way to compute a, a core outcome uh, very simply. Uh, we can define a notion of competitive equilibrium here, so that would be what we would uh, find familiar from first year microeconomics. Agents are uh, maximizing their utility. There is a price uh, vector, a price for every house. Um, imagine the prices are such that the houses that are transacted in the first step have higher prices than the houses in the second step. The houses in the second step have higher prices than those in the third step. Uh, and you can show that that price vector and the outcome of TTC support a competitive equilibrium. Okay, agents will be maximizing their preferences subject to their budget constraint. Okay? Now if we think about uh, the core as a mechanism, agents report their preferences, uh, uh, the core as a direct mechanism is a strategy proof mechanism. Okay? So uh, what that means again, just like in a serial dictatorship, uh, I have uh, <coughs> a weekly dominant strategy to report my ranking of houses uh, truthfully. Okay? And in this domain, we have an even sharper result, uh, which is that the core is the only mechanism that is Pareto efficient, individually rational, uh, and strategy proof for the housing market problem. Okay, so um, this is a very sharp characterization uh, in terms of these three axioms. You can uh, think of it that way. Efficiency, individual rationality, and uh, strategy proofness. This is all we can do. Okay. Um, now, uh, yes, question, yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. For the first problem, isn't a serial dictatorship the, uh, the only thing that'll work? For, um, uh, so, the houses are collectively owned. that uh, the only Pareto efficient and strategy proof mechanism is a serial. We have results that are very close to that. Uh, so we need some other axiom to complete the characterization there. So there's typically some kind of neutrality uh, type axiom or consistency type axiom there. Yeah. Um, yes? Um, if A likes B's house and B likes C's house and C likes A's house, then there is no cycle and it's not quite efficient, right? Uh, say, say that again. So A, so A like B's house. So I like your house, OK. Yeah, and I like Elton's house. Yeah. And Elton likes your house. Yeah. So we, all, we would all trade. We would have a cycle. Ah, you can have a you can have a three-way cycle. If there's uh, uh, N agents, we can have an N-way cycle where we all, all trade, right? Okay. Okay. Exactly, right. Uh, so cycles can also involve just one person. Uh, and that's exactly the reason why it's Pareto efficient, right? We're looking for <coughs> mutually uh, agreeable swaps uh, in a particular fashion uh, here, uh, exactly. Are there any other questions? Okay, so uh, this is now, we're now into 1980s, okay? Uh, and um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, literature here was, I think, res resuscitated in some respects by an interest in a hybrid scenario uh, between uh, the case where we have no endowments, where we started with the house allocation problem, and a case where we have endowments, the housing market model. What if we have a situation where not everyone has an endowment, okay? Um, we can think of uh, that model uh, as uh, a model where the agents who do not have endowments maybe have some kind of existing property right or priority for vacant houses. Okay, so where could these property rights or priorities have come from? Um, in uh, um, some settings, we can think of these as due to the outcome of lottery draws. So imagine we're trying to allocate dorm rooms. There are some incumbents who have uh, their existing dorm room. There's some freshman newcomers 
Uh, maybe there's a, a, a queue based on uh, lottery draws. Um, and uh, we can take this TTC idea and make a very minor tweak to it. Uh, the way I first described TTC is I have agents pointing to other agents, okay? Um, and we look for cycles where uh, the cycles are between agents. Suppose instead of uh, having agents pointing to the owner of the house, um, we have agents actually point to houses, okay? Um, that is the, the adaptation uh, of TTC that allows for its use in uh, uh, um, richer environments. So rather than pointing to uh, uh, a given house, I point to the, uh, uh, rather than pointing to the owner of a house, I point to the house itself. What does this accommodate? This accommodates the possibility that a house may not have an owner, okay? Uh, and so what the house is going to do in this uh, setting is point to the agent who's got the highest priority, okay? Um, and that allows me to deal with a situation where not all agents uh, have endowments um, and some houses uh, um, <coughs> don't have owners, okay? And so this uh, basic observation actually was central to uh, initial proposals for thinking about top trading cycles in environments where there are some priorities, okay? So uh, we start the model where Agents may not have an endowment, but there are some existing structure of property rights, uh, like in the case of school allocation. Okay, so uh, our uh, situation of school allocation is one where we have students who have preferences over schools. Um, in the simplest uh, model, schools prioritize uh, students. Okay, those priorities could be based on things like lottery numbers or uh, test scores. And uh, we can implement a top trading cycles um, based algorithm uh, simply by having the schools point to the student who's got the highest property right or the highest priority uh, at the school. Okay, and everything else proceeds uh, as uh, before. And so uh, let me show you a very real world example of this, uh, but there are some questions before I do that. Yes, Eric, yeah. Uh, so that assumes that there's a, that there's a strict priority. So That's correct, yeah. So the, the, there's a tie. So yeah, so um, turns out a lot of things change. Okay, so I'm gonna come to that. Let me defer that. Uh, that's a great question, okay? That, that's maybe one of the most important new wrinkles uh, in the school assignment problem. Yeah, your question. I think he was asking about ties in the preference ranking. Did you say- On the school side rankings, the priorities, yeah. Uh, if you like it, you get it. But there are 10 of us who all like his house. Right. But, 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 but. If I'm one of those 10 and I'm endowed with that house, I would, I would get it. Okay. Right, that's property. Right, right. So yeah. if there are, you don't like your own house and a bunch of other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the mechanism? So in the, in the top trading cycles model, right, all 10 people will be pointing to my house, right? I will be pointing somewhere else, okay? Let's say there's only 10 guys, so I'll be pointing to one of those 10 guys. The person who, for whom um, I trade with would get the house. So I'd be pointing to you, you point to me, we trade, right? Uh, exactly, so that, that's what determines uh, um, the outcome. Yeah? Is there any characterization with the priority? So like in the housing model, right? Mm -hmm. you have that the three people who are actually Uh, there are two, two results on, on that question. Um, um, the first uh, paper uh, is one by Sylvia Papai in Econometrica. Um, uh, and that is, uh, so the, just again, what is the question, right? So, you know, one way we can tie the bow on this literature are results like this that say, this is all we got. This is a class of mechanisms that uh, satisfy these three uh, desirable properties. What happens uh, in this particular domain, right, is the question. Um, and um, there's, yeah, so there's two papers I'd point you to. We can talk more about this afterwards. So Sylvia Papai's Econometrica paper. Uh, that paper relies on a, th a, a new axiom that uh, only appears in that paper, actually. So it's maybe not something that is as uh, familiar as efficiency and, and strategy proof. Uh, there's a paper that came out in Theoretical Economics last year by um, Marek Pitcha and, Ut and Utku Unver that gets rid of that axiom, so it has a complete characterization of efficient and strategy-proof 
um, uh, um, mechanisms in this hybrid scenario. So um, you can take a look at that, right? Um, you know, r what do those mechanisms look like? They look like very elaborate versions of top trading cycles, okay, where uh, the priorities are allowed to ne change based on the sets of cycles that might form um, and um, things like that. Um, okay, let, let me go back to this uh, uh, picture here because this illustrates what I just talked about. So suppose we want to use top trading cycles in a situation where we have priorities and not necessarily endowments. Um, this is how this was described uh, to folks in uh, New Orleans where uh, a mechanism based on top trading cycles was actually used to allocate uh, children to school. So in New Orleans, they're talking about two different scenarios. So this is from the newspaper. And, you know, I, f I always find this interesting because this is how the public learns about these algorithms. So in scenario A, we have a self-cycle, a cycle involving a student, um, number one, uh, uh, where it says here, you can't read this well probably, a student number one is ranked school A as her top choice. Um, and in this scenario, student one gets a seat at her top ranked school um, because it's just a cycle where he's pointing to the school for which um, he's got the highest priority. In scenario B, we have that example of a three-way cycle that we just talked about. School A is now pointing to student one who points to school B, his top choice. Uh, B points to student two who's got the highest priority uh, at school um, B. Student two then goes on to point uh, to school C. Student three is the highest priority uh, student at school C. Um, so uh, C points to student three. And we complete the cycle by student three pointing back to school A, okay? So in the actual uh, allocation system, we implement this uh, cycle. In the case of school assignment, um, Schools have more than one seat, so uh, suppose school A had 10 seats. If we find a cycle like this, we would reduce the capacity of A by one, and we would just continue. Yeah, question? Uh -huh. If we were a competitive Ethereum, would we need sort of rushing rule, or prices would just be required? Uh, so we can define a competitive equilibrium uh, in, in this class of models. Um, here we have to um, think a little bit about the priorities in that case. Uh, so. We have to be a little bit more clever about the price vector that we play with. But, you know, my perspective is why bother? I mean, we don't need it, right? Uh, so we can directly compute the outcome without relying on prices. Uh, um, so, um, great. Okay, so next question. Yeah, uh-huh. Great. Well, in every cycle, if I'm um, trading as a student, I'm getting my most preferred option among what's available, right? So that's why it's Pareto efficient uh, for uh, students. Uh, but you're asking something that I'm going to come to next, which is what about the school side and how should we think about their considerations, okay? So let me come to that after introducing the third class of mechanisms that I want you to know about, okay? So that are uh, the class of uh, stable mechanisms uh, um, or uh, DA, deferred acceptance, okay? So, um, Deferred acceptance uh, is um, uh, defined as follows. So this, is, again, is a, an idea due to Gale uh, and uh, also Shapley here. Um, so what is our, our environment? So we've gone from a situation where we have agents wanting houses to a situation where maybe the houses have some priorities over the agents, okay? And uh, we're assuming throughout that these are, st like, strict, okay? So the houses... Uh, prioritize uh, agents in a strict manner. Um, we can reformulate that model and think of this as simply as men and women, and this is what Gale and Shapley initially proposed. Uh, we have men who have preferences over women, women have strict preferences over men, and we're looking for a way to pair them together, okay? So this is why this is called a marriage problem. Uh, and um, the uh, college admissions variation on this is students have preferences over colleges, Colleges have preferences over students, but now colleges have more than one seat. Okay, so that's the uh, model that's called a many-to-one uh, matching model. Okay, so again, the jargon. Okay, the, I think often when you see this literature, there's feels like there's a lot of jargon here. The house problem, the marriage problem, the college problem. Housing is a one-sided matching problem because it's agents being matched to houses. We don't really care about the utility of the houses. Okay, uh, in. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in the model, at least. <laughs> so in uh, uh, the literature on deferred acceptance, we call it a two-sided matching model because uh, there are two sides, you know, men and women or students and colleges, 
and we may care about uh, welfare of, uh, of both sides here. Okay, so that's why it's related to that earlier question. So uh, let me tell you about how deferred acceptance uh, works, okay? So uh, in deferred acceptance, um, <clears throat> in step one, uh, each student, uh, so I'm going to do this with a student school uh, uh, language, is going to propose to her first choice. Each school is going to tentatively assign its seats to its proposers one at a time following uh, the priority order of the school. Okay? Um, the key word here is tentative. So in step one, the proposals are tentatively held. Any remaining proposer is rejected. Um, and in the general step, step K here, each student who was rejected in the previous step proposes to her, her next choice. The schools are going to consider these new proposals together with the applicants that they had tentatively accepted uh, uh, up to date, up to that round, and select the best uh, in that group. Okay? Uh, and how are we going to select the best? Well, one at a time according to the priority order, uh, and any remaining proposers are going to be rejected. So this algorithm will terminate when there are either no new proposals or uh, each student has exhausted uh, their rank order list. Okay? So, you know, one of the things, whenever uh, I talk about deferred acceptance, you know, I say, you know, in deferred acceptance, it could happen, could be the case that uh, I've listed a school, say, 12th, uh, and Eric has ranked it first, and I get assigned that school over Eric. And that sounds kind of unintuitive. Why would that happen? Well, it could happen because Eric has tended, you know, applied to his school uh, that he's listed first. The school has tentatively held him throughout the process of this algorithm. I, on the other hand, have applied to 12 other schools, and eventually I would apply to the school that Eric has ranked first. Uh, I'd only do that if I've been rejected from all of my higher rank choices. So at the stage in which I would apply to the same school as Eric, you can think of that as my effective top choice. Right? I've been rejected from all of my higher rank choices. And the way this algorithm works, the deferring, the tentative assignment here that's so central, is when my proposal comes in, the school will look at me versus Eric and say, I actually like Parag better than Eric, so Eric is uh, rejected, okay? <laughs> so um, that sounds very counterintuitive, actually. Uh, despite that, uh, what I'm gonna tell you about is this mechanism, you know, amazingly has been discovered in the field uh, several times, okay? So one reason why this mechanism is so uh, uh, iconic is that uh, the very uh, uh, first time um, that this was uh, widely deployed was in the 1950s in the United States in um, the U.S. medical residency labor market. So every year in the U.S., and now this is true in many other countries, if you graduate from medical school, you go through a centralized clearinghouse to get your first job. Okay? And uh, in the 30s and uh, 20s, there were different procedures that uh, different regional uh, labor markets experimented with and finally the uh, Association of Medical Students and uh, the major residency training programs came together in the early 50s and said why don't we integrate the market across the United States and why don't we use, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't called deferred acceptance at the time, but why don't we use the Boston Pool Plan algorithm which turns out to be equivalent to uh, the deferred acceptance algorithm. And what's really quite amazing about that is this happened more than a decade before Gail and Shapley's first article on this topic. So this was a mechanism that was uh, invented by the participants uh, themselves. And I'll tell you a couple more examples where we've seen deferred acceptance uh, emerge uh, organically from the field. Uh, before telling you about those examples, though, let me tell you about some very important results on deferred acceptance. Okay, so um, again here, this is really a helicopter tour. So. I won't be able to give you the proofs of these results. Uh, there's a, a, a book by Roth and Sotomayor that has some of these results. Um, but uh, the main results that I want you to know about um, are the following. So the first is what I'm calling side optimality and opposing interests. So uh, the way we define this algorithm here is students are proposing to schools. You could have easily thought of the opposite, schools proposing to students. And uh, that would define another version of uh, deferred acceptance. Um, <clears throat> the first uh, uh, important result about deferred acceptance that actually Gail and Shapley pointed out in that very uh, um, initial article is that uh, the side uh, who proposes ends up at an outcome that is um, uh, a stable outcome uh, that is best for the proposing side. So let me first define what I mean by a stable outcome. A stable outcome 
is an outcome that is not blocked by uh, uh, either an individual or by a student and school pair. What does it mean to block by an individual? Uh, a block by an individual means at the outcome of, uh, after we uh, have an allocation, uh, I as an individual can say, I'd rather uh, uh, not participate, I'd rather be matched to myself than what the mechanism prescribed for me. If that's the case, it's not individually rational and we would say it's blocked by an individual. A block by a pair is a situation where uh, the student in the school uh, want to get a divorce from one another, okay, and would rather recontract with someone else, okay. So more specifically, an allocation is not blocked by a pair if there is no student in school for whom the student would rather be matched to another school and that school would rather have that student than someone who's been assigned to it, okay. So the deferred acceptance algorithm uh, is an algorithm that produces an outcome that is stable, okay. And in this problem, uh, stability is sufficient for it to be a core outcome, okay. So uh, these are the same themes that we saw with top trading cycles. We have a, a core uh, outcome. Yes, Ariel? Yeah, so when you say maximum shock, you might have no cycle because it's actually going to be a In the model, we, we have a lot of flexibility with what we want to do there. So um, if I think about this for schools, uh, I would be, you know, leaving the district, going to private school, um, maybe going to an alternative sector that's not in the match exactly. So uh, for this allocation uh, rule, uh, um, you never have a situation where uh, what you assign me is actually um, <coughs> uh, a school that I would turn down and rather leave the, uh, leave the market. Yeah. Mm? Um, people do think hard about that. So one of the challenges there, so that's a really interesting question. So suppose you had data from a, a matching system uh, and um, the data are rank orderless, so students ranking schools. Um, <clears throat> what do we want to interpret uh, if the ranking is not complete, okay? So a natural thing to say is if I rank three schools and then uh, that's it, my fourth choice is leave the market and go elsewhere, right? Uh, and People have different approaches to that, that question. Um, uh, sometimes people ignore that question and look at just at inside good uh, demand. Um, in other situations, uh, folks have access to better data on the outside option, so you can actually see where people are going. And that tells you the relative ranking of goods in the market versus goods outside of the market. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a real challenge actually for empirical work because uh, it seems like it's almost costless to rank everything, right, in practice. If I really want to leave the market, uh, I could submit a complete rank order list, look at what choice I get, and then leave the market. Uh, so why is it that people don't have complete lists in practice, right? And um, um, there are, yeah, so that, that's an issue that this uh, empirical work has. So I think Nikhil may talk a little bit about this, yeah, uh, a bit more when we, we talk about the data from these systems. Okay, great. Okay, so let me now continue with this helicopter tour of important results. So we've just uh, said that deferred acceptance produces a stable outcome, okay, one that's not blocked by an individual or by a pair. It turns out uh, it produces uh, uh, a stable outcome that is best for the proposing side. So that's what I mean by side optimality. If the students propose, uh, as I've just uh, described it here, the outcome of the student proposing deferred acceptance algorithm is a student optimal stable matching, okay? Uh, and indeed, if we have a model where the preferences are strict uh, uh, throughout, uh, there is a unique student optimal stable matching and that's computed by deferred acceptance, okay? Uh, now, <clears throat> opposing interest refers to this idea that what's good for one side of the market is bad for the other side of the market. So the student optimal stable matching is actually the least uh, preferred stable matching for schools, okay? Uh, and uh, vice versa, if we had the version of this algorithm where schools proposed to students, we would have the school optimal stable matching, and that is the worst stable matching for students, okay? And so that's a consistent theme that we see uh, throughout the literature on two-sided uh, matching markets, that there is a lot of consensus on the same side as to what's good for that side, and a lot of conflict across the two sides uh, of the market. Um, the next result is a result about incentives, okay, so um, this takes us to the early 1980s. If I think about the deferred acceptance uh, algorithm as a direct mechanism, 
where we have uh, the students and the schools report their preferences, um, the uh, <coughs> uh, first result is that there is no strategy proof mechanism for both sides of the market. Okay, so there is no way to get to a stable outcome uh, that, uh, in a strategy proof way when both men and women are uh, submitting their preferences. If instead we focus our attention to one side of the market, um, we have a possibility result. Uh, and that uh, result is in the man proposing variation of deferred acceptance, um, <coughs> it is a, a dominant strategy, weekly dominant strategy for men to report their preferences truthfully uh, and vice versa for women. Okay, um, and you know, just a little bit of history here, right? So, you know, in the, as I understand this, and you know, Eric can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you know, in the 1970s, there was a, a very exciting research program trying to look at strategy proofness as a goal uh, in design, and that research program quickly ran up against these impossibility results, okay? Uh, so that's the gibbert satterthwaite theorem uh, and its uh, cousins. Uh, and, you know, gibbard satterthwaite is very closely connected to Arrow's impossibility theorem, as we know. Um, and what was very exciting about this class of models, someone described this to me as a breath of fresh air, is we actually found real uh, uh, plausible mechanisms that are strategy proof. Um, so uh, that's one thing that's quite exciting. We have systems that uh, are strategy proof, even if in this limited way for one si side of the market. So. Um, all three of these mechanisms, serial dictatorship, top trading cycles, and deferred acceptance, uh, are strategy proof. Um, yeah. Is uh, this uh, impossibility problem solved by cardinality of preferences? The impossibility problem? Yeah. Uh, it's not. Uh, um, um, so you're absolutely right. So everything I'm working with here is with ordinal preferences. So that's just a ranking. Uh, so the question is thinking, suppose we put numeric values, say, I like school one, um, uh, you know, you know, much ten times more than school two. Uh, can I do do more with that? I can't surmount the impossibility results. Um, <clears throat> there are um, uh, a series of uh, recent papers trying to ask whether uh, we can use that kind of information to improve the performance of, of deferred acceptance. Um, and I think it, my reading of that is it's still quite mixed. It's not clear. Um, it, there's this other complication that we never really see uh, in these domains where these models appear uh, cardinal information directly elicited. Um, so um, <coughs> um, that's why I, I think people haven't explored that that much. Now the last thing I'll say about that is um, strategy proofness is a very demanding concept because it's a finite economy concept, right? So for me to show something is not strategy proof, I just need to come up with an example where you know, someone can manipulate the, the mechanism. Are these examples relevant for practice and design? They may not be that relevant uh, in situations uh, where maybe there's many agents. Uh, and um, uh, so I'll come to that in just a second. Yeah, other question, Eric? Yeah. So, so ju just to supplement that answer, there, there have been mechanisms which, uh, which exploit people's attitudes towards risk. Yeah. So you can. Uh, if you look at the form in Morgenstern Utilities, uh, and uh, from that point of view, I like uh, A a lot better than B. Maybe you don't like A so much better than B. Then it may be possible for us to do a trade in probabilities. It's, it's like a competitive equilibrium without money, but with, with probabilities are swapped, and, and those have been used. They have, yeah, that's a, that's a great comment, right? So, uh, you know, one place where that kind of idea is sometimes used is in what they call funny money systems. Like, if I'm trying to allocate courses at a business school, uh, some of the schemes try to implement versions of, of that idea. They're, and, not, they're, they're, not strategy they're not strategy proof, but, you know, just like the competitive mechanism is not strategy proof, in some large market sense, we can say people are like price takers. And so your ability to uh, gain from a manipulation is shrinking, say, as the market gets large. So we may not need to worry about that, actually. So let me actually jump to that. This is kind of the, this point number six here, and we'll come back to these other points. So one of the, the newer things that you would not see, say, in, in the Roth Sotomayor book on matching, but it's something that we've learned in the last uh, two decades or so, is that in actual uh, uh, two-sided uh, matching markets, we tend to find that um, 
the set of stable outcomes is quite small. Um, so this is a phenomena, for instance, seen in the US medical residency matching market, uh, in several school assignment markets, even though in principle we could have many different uh, stable uh, 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 matchings, core, core matchings, in practice we typically see you know, at most one or two. Or, um, and so uh, there is an attempt to try to explain that phenomena. Um, uh, and uh, what's important about that is when we have uh, uh, in the marriage problem, say a singleton core, a, a, a unique stable matching, uh, then um, there is a no possibility for agents to manipulate. So if we know the primitives are such that we'll have a, uh, a unique stable matching, uh, there's no way uh, we'd want to, to manipulate. So that's one sense in which uh, maybe we don't need to worry so much about this uh, impossibility result. So how have folks gone about number six? So there's really two stra strands of literature thinking about matching in, in large markets. One is a, a strand of literature that um, looks at uh, continuum models of matching. So the idea is we take a, a given economy and we replicate it. So take the uh, students in schools and make a copy of them. Okay. Um, so for every student, we'll say there's uh, actually types of students and we have two copies of each type. We have three copies of each type, so on and so forth. This is a very old idea from general equilibrium theory. This type replication idea uh, is actually very uh, much what folks were looking at with the core and competitive equilibria in the 1960s. The second class of models that uh, folks have uh, looked at are random preference models where we make some assumption about the data, the data generating process for preferences and think about what happens um, as we expand uh, the market uh, size. And in kind of both classes of models, we now have some understanding of, uh, of this small core uh, phenomena. Okay. So that's, that's number six, and that's related to the strategy proofness idea. Let me jump back up to number three. And uh, number three is what I'm calling rural hospitals. Okay, so I've chosen these names, hopefully, so that you remember this. I don't know if I'm going to succeed on that. But rural hospitals is this idea that I think you can remember by uh, a story on the debate that led to what's called rural hospitals. So here is the debate. So in the United States, they're using deferred acceptance for medical students. And what you tended to see is in many rural areas of the United States, um, uh, the hospitals are not meeting their capacity. So I, I'm a residency training program that has 10 slots, and I only have, um, say, five uh, doctors who are a match to me. So people were concerned, well, why is it that rural hospitals appear to be discriminated against? They're not getting their quota. Is it because of the algorithm? Okay. And what the rural hospitals uh, theorem says, and there's very d different versions of this, is that if I am not meeting my quota um, and I matched five people, I will be matched those same five people in all stable matchings. Okay? So you cannot blame the algorithm for the fact that I didn't exactly meet my, my quota. Okay? So other versions of this are if I look across the set of stable matchings, the agents who are unassigned are the same uh, across all stable matchings. Okay? So there again, if we want to minimize uh, unassigned students, don't blame stability as the concept, okay? So that's uh, the uh, third, uh, I think, important result. The fourth uh, result is what I'm calling order independence, okay? So this is also actually not in the roth Sotomayor book. This is a, an important result because um, what it says is when I actually implement deferred acceptance on a computer, um, the way I defined it here involves simultaneous proposals in each step, right? I could have equally well done this in an iterative way where I take a given student, have him propose to his top choice, take another student, have him propose to his top choice. If he causes a rejection of that first student, put that first student back in the queue. You know, take my second student, he's tentatively held. Take a third student, it could be a different student, it could be the first student, uh, have them propose, so on and so forth. If I think about deferred acceptance as a recursive procedure of proposal and rejection, I can iterate through students in any uh, order, and I will get the same exact outcome as the simultaneous proposing version of deferred acceptance, okay? And so this makes it um, very uh, easy to implement deferred acceptance in practice. I think it's one reason why we tend to see people discover deferred acceptance uh, in the field, because uh, this is a, maybe a natural thing. Let's just pick people one at a time, according to any order, have them apply to their most preferred thing, uh, and then pick the next person, have them apply to their most preferred thing. Okay. 
Um, and you can see very quickly that the set of proposals and rejections from this iterative sequential version of deferred acceptance will be identical to the simultaneous version. Yeah. Is this result true only for perfect information and independent preferences? So, so my model here, I'm assuming we, we start with strict preferences of st uh, students uh, and schools. Yeah. The, the last thing I want to tell you about is a result that's actually due to um, a mathematician, John Conway. Uh, and that's a result uh, that tells us a bit more about the structure of uh, stable matchings. Um, it turns out that we can take any two stable matchings and define the following operator. Um, take the two matchings, pick the allocation that is better for one side. Um, uh, and construct another matching. So if I'm a man and I match to my first choice under one stable matching and my fifth choice under another stable matching, I'm going to combine um, these two stable matchings. For each man, I'm going to look at which assignment I prefer. So I prefer my first to my fifth and construct a matching where um, each man is uh, assigned to his most preferred alternative. And you know, the flip of that each is each woman is assigned to her least preferred of those two stable matchings. And it turns out that that itself creates another stable matching, okay? So I have this way to take any t arbitrary two stable matchings, apply this join operator, we can call it, um, where I basically choose the better assignment for one side, and I construct another stable matching, okay? And this is a, an important result for two reasons, I think. Um, the first is it illustrates this opposing interest idea yet again, right? So I can construct a matching from two separate matchings by choosing what's better for one side. Okay, that's going to be a stable match. So there's some unanimity in terms of what one side wants and uh, what's good for one side is bad for the other side. The other reason this is important is we've learned in the last you know, 15, 20 years that um, the mathematics of lattices are very powerful in economic theory and people have used those ideas to uh, understand the structure of uh, two-sided matching models in a lot more detail. So that's one of the big uh, achievements of this last g um, literature on the generalizations of deferred acceptance. Okay, um, Great, and so we've talked about small cores uh, and large markets. So here is my five minute summary of this massive literature on uh, um, <coughs> uh, two-sided matching models. Let me make one last comment, <coughs> um, something I've kind of glossed over. So I said there's this marriage model, which is the one-to-one -one, uh, matching model, and then there's the college admissions model, the many-to-one matching model. In the many-to-one case, if a college has many seats, um, we have to think a little bit carefully about how is the college going to evaluate groups of students, okay? Um, and for all of this technology to work, for all of these results to apply, we typically need some additional structure on uh, the college's uh, preferences over groups of students. That structure comes in the form of some um, notion of a substitutes condition, okay? So that is, uh, students are substitutable um, for, for one another. And um, <coughs> um, once we assume some kind of notion of substitutes, uh, everything will work. Uh, without that, uh, nothing works, okay? So it's a pretty sharp uh, demanding requirement. So why is this important for practical applications? If we worry about some kind of complementarities in a real matching market, like it's really essential for me if I'm building, say, a, a school that I have both Eric and Ariel teaching at the school, but I don't want either of them in isolation, then uh, we're going to run into trouble with using uh, these uh, ideas, okay? Um, if on the other hand, if I like both Ar Ariel and Eric at my school, but I'm also willing to take Eric by himself and Ariel by himself, uh, then we're in a, a good situation, okay? So that's what substitutes uh, is going to be imposing. Okay. So now um, we've talked about one-sided matching, we've talked about two-sided matching. Let me talk a little bit more about school assignment because this is a, a class of uh, environments. It's right at the middle of one-sided matching and two-sided uh, matching. It's right at the middle because it uh, <coughs> raises the question of what do we think of uh, a school? Is a school someone whose preferences or priorities we need to respect? Uh, do we think about them as part of the welfare calculation about allocations? Um, <clears throat> or are schools passive objects like houses, uh, for which maybe we don't care so much about uh, the welfare uh, of houses? So, um, <clears throat> so that's the first thing I've, I've written here. So the new question with school assignment involves um, 
what do we think about uh, our interpretation of schools and their preferences? So the dominant environment in uh, the United States is schools actually do not actively rank uh, students. Um, the ranking comes from some exogenously given criteria like do you live in the walk zone or do you have a sibling at the school? So when we think about stability, this idea that there's no blocking, if a school is uh, ranking someone based on, say, a lottery number, maybe we don't need to care so much about an interpretation of stability coming from recontracting, okay? Because it's not the case that the school is going to go after the market is run and said, well, actually, I wanted you and you wanted me uh, if the school is just using a lottery number, okay? So in that passive object view of a school, stability uh, is maybe not motivated by a recontracting uh, motivation. The motivation for something like stability uh, could come instead from an equity concern. So we don't want to have a situation where a student can say, I'd rather go to a school and I actually had a higher claim to that school. Uh, say I lived in the walk zone uh, and you assign someone that school who doesn't live in the walk zone. Uh, that would be something we may want to care about if uh, we cared about um, 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 respecting priorities uh, in some sense. What the literature calls that is um, uh, a situation where uh, we have eliminated justified envy. Okay, so that's a mouthful, but what does that mean? Let's break that down. So uh, a situation of envy is a situation where I would, I'm envious of the assignment of someone else. Okay, I'd rather get something that someone else got. Justified envy means my envy is actually justified. It would be justified, for instance, if I had a higher claim to that school. Okay. Uh, so that sounds very much like a blocking pair, and it is, um, just uh, relabeled for the case where we think of schools as, as uh, passive objects. Uh, and so if we have an allocation where we've eliminated justified and we, we have an allocation where there is no blocking pair, we could call that a stable allocation. Um, but the literature tends to call this uh, the elimination of, of justified envy because they want to give uh, or endow stability with this different interpretation. Okay. So that's something uh, that's an important uh, new wrinkle here. And this shows exactly the sense in which school assignment is in, in between one-sided uh, and two-sided matching. The second uh, issue here is something that was actually already asked. What do we do in the situation where rankings are not strict? Okay. Um, yes, Ella. Can I just ask you about this again? Because, uh, uh, before we move into this one. Yeah. Well, if we take this perspective, which I think is the correct perspective. Wh wh what's this? And then, uh, <laughs> wh no, what, what, what? Okay, at, at, well, you know, the, the schools don't really have preferences. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. justified claims that are not fulfilled mm -hmm. because uh, uh, you know if this this number is not high then we might say okay we need to compromise in order to get uh, some sort of you know, yeah to get stability or to get so you know, we have a mechanism that produce something that is close to what we would like in the sense that the percentage of students who in some sense have a justified claim that is not satisfied is not yeah. Yeah, so that, that is there, is there some work about there, there how is how many uh, such problematic uh, uh, claims that that's a beautiful question. Can I can I wait one slide and I'll tell you about a new result on that, okay, actually. Okay. So but let me give you a little bit more context for that result. So let's go back to our two f algorithms that we've talked about, deferred acceptance and top trading cycles, right? We know that deferred acceptance is going to produce an outcome that's stable. And if we want to interpret schools as passive objects, that will be free from justified envy. Top trading cycles will not do that. Okay? Um, top trading cycles, because of you know, that example that we just talked about, um, we can have a situation where someone trades into a school by virtue of the fact that someone is pointing to them. Um, that allows for a situation where we have kind of overridden the priority, right? We've pri prioritized trading of students over the uh, um, property rights uh, structure. Um, and so there's this real tension. Do we care about eliminating justified envy uh, or do we care about efficiency, okay? And 
that's one of the things we need to resolve when we think about um, do we like deferred acceptance as a solution or top trading cycles a as a solution. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that more on the next slide. Uh, but before I do that, let me mention a couple more things, okay? And so uh, this, this is a second really uh, uh, interesting thing. So these models we've talked about so far are assuming that preferences are strict. Um, when rankings are not strict, um, we have uh, a whole host of new issues to, to deal with, okay? So the first sense in which uh, rankings are not strict is on the school side, right? So a school side ranking uh, need not be strict in practice. The priorities are often very coarse, like uh, someone has a sibling at a school. Many people have siblings, so how do we adjudicate claims between those uh, applicants? The walk zone concept, so that's like a catchment area around a school. Many students are in the walk zone. Uh, how should we break ties uh, amongst that group? Okay. Um, and uh, there are many ways to think about breaking ties, but as soon as we start a model where uh, the rankings are not strict, um, we need to go back to first principles and ask which of our properties uh, still hold. And so there is a literature trying to do that. Um, and um, one of the kind of headlines of um, that literature is in the uh, model where preferences are strict on both sides and deferred acceptance, we have a unique optimal matching for the proposing side. As soon as we introduce any indifferences, there's no longer a unique uh, optimal s stable matching for the proposing side. So there's multiplicity. There's a question of how do we resolve that multiplicity. Another very practical question is um, how should we break ties? Uh, so uh, there, one uh, possibility is we use the same random number at uh, every uh, school. So say uh, Elhan and I have applied to school A and school B. We draw one random number and I have a better number than Alhanan. Uh, I will outrank him at A and I'll also outrank him at B. The alternative is maybe we draw separate lottery numbers at A and at B. Um, and uh, the question uh, is what's better, okay? Um, and this is a question that um, I can say in every school district that I've interacted with, uh, this question has come up. Uh, uh, so this is kind of fun because this is a question I don't think we would have asked had we not actually talked to school districts about uh, their matching protocols. And there are results that uh, argue that having one random number tends to be better than having a separate random number for uh, each possible um, school. Um, great. Okay. Um, yeah, Ariel. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Why do we additionally have that in the mechanism? Yeah, that's a great question. So you're absolutely right. If you look at the patterns of choice, people care a lot about proximity, right? So in some sense, that's baked in uh, to the um, uh, allocation. People will be assigned to schools close to home because that's, that's what they want. Uh, one rationale for, for walk zones actually comes back to the big debate about why do we have a choice system to begin with? Um, and, um, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a sense in which we want to give extra uh, 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 priority to folks to attend schools in, in their neighborhood. So I could flip your question on the head and say, why don't we have 100% of seats use a walk zone, right? If we want people to go to schools close to them, that's what people want, why don't we try to respect that claim, right? And the way that I tend to see this actually play out is, walk zones emerge as some kind of compromise between these two factions. So one faction who says, I don't like choice at all, I just want to have a neighborhood school system where I go to school down the street, the closest school to where I live. Um, and another faction that says, that's not fair, that's particularly not fair for the neighborhoods that don't have very good schools. So why don't we have some notion of a, a walk zone where some fraction of seats are reserved for kids uh, from uh, the walk zone? So this is typically a political compromise. The same question you could ask for any of the priorities, actually. Uh, why do we have a sibling priority? Uh, you know, it should be baked into preferences. If parents want to send their kids to the same school, uh, they would rank the same school. Um, in some sense, we want the system to honor those claims and maybe prioritize those claims. That's why we uh, have a sibling priority. So um, that, that's an, an additional uh, lever. I will say, you know, the hot button issue in districts with these choice systems involves this priority design question. What is a fair way for children to be admitted into schools? So 
Um, <clears throat> Boston, for instance, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, used to use a walk zone system. Um, so every school, half the seats were reserved for kids from the walk zone. And in 2014, they said, we're going to do away with walk zones. So there's no more of a walk. So people are always tinkering with this lever, and it's really kind of uh, this uh, equity distri distributional consideration that they're thinking about. Uh, another place where this is very, very active, if you look at the U.S. press right now, there are very strong debates on should we have test-based criteria to admit children into schools. So uh, that's something that several cities, most prominently New York City, is uh, actively considering. So the mayor in New York City came out uh, a couple weeks ago and said, we have schools that admit children based on test scores. That's not fair. Uh, I want to get rid of this, uh, at least for some fraction of the seats. Uh, is, is that a good uh, system or not? Okay. Um, Okay, so let me come down to uh, Ahanan's question. So um, <clears throat> this question about deferred acceptance versus top trading cycles, um, <clears throat> what do we know in terms of uh, the trade-offs between uh, these uh, mechanisms? So let me tell you about a few results, and then I'll tell you about something that's a bit newer that we've understood about this. So the f kind of starting point is um, there is this tension between getting to an efficient outcome and getting to an outcome that's free uh, of justified envy. And that uh, tension was first shown in an example by um, Roth in 1982, which said uh, it's possible that we have a matching that's free of justified envy, that's not Pareto efficient. Um, so because that exists, there is no mechanism that is going to be both Pareto efficient and uh, without justified envy. So you could ask for something a little bit less demanding. Uh, can I find a mechanism that is strategy proof that selects an outcome that is um, uh, Pareto efficient and free of justified envy if that happens to exist. Okay, so we know that doesn't always exist, but suppose we're in an uh, economy where that exists, is there a way to get there? And what Keston uh, shows is no, there's no strategy proof way to, to get there. Okay, so uh, the kind of logic is if I'm thinking about uh, a allocation system and my kind of ranking of axioms is, is the following. I care about strategy proofness first, uh, and then I care about um, eliminating justified envy, and then I care about efficiency. Uh, you could think of the results of Gale and Shapley, uh, that there is a student optimal matching as a natural recipe for us. Okay, I um, run the student proposing deferred acceptance algorithm, that's going to be strategy proof. It's going to be free of justified envy. And within that class, it is going to be the <coughs> uh, uh, constrained efficient allocation that is free from justified envy. Okay? So uh, the argument went, if we value the elimination of justified envy first and then Pareto efficiency, uh, deferred acceptance is a natural choice. Uh, what we don't know is, uh, suppose our preferences were different. We cared about Pareto efficiency first. Uh, and then the elimination of justified envy. What is the good choice of a mechanism? Okay. So uh, put another way, I can give you a formal basis for choosing deferred acceptance as solving some kind of constrained uh, uh, maximization problem. Can I give you a similar basis for top trading cycles? Okay. Uh, and so you could say, well, what else would you do? Uh, well, I said top trading cycles is strategy proof and it's efficient uh, in uh, this context. Um, I haven't given you any formal sense in which, uh, how it uses priorities, right? So if I said we want something that's strategy proof and efficient, you could tell me why don't we just do a serial dictatorship in the context of schools. So that's also strategy proof and that's also efficient. And there's something uncomfortable about that. In a serial dictatorship, we're not really using the priorities, right? In top trading cycles, the priorities set up this uh, property rights regime which is the basis for trade, right? In a serial dictatorship, it's the serial order that determines uh, everything. So what I want to tell you about very briefly is uh, uh, some uh, work trying to um, uh, give a formal basis for top trading cycles. And uh, to do that, I'm going to introduce this idea of a, a problem-wise comparison uh, as follows. So suppose I have two mechanisms, um, <coughs> psi and uh, phi. I will say that phi has less envy uh, than psi for a given set of priorities. So that's what the, um, uh, this notation refers to. If for any set of preferences P and student school pair IS, if student uh, school pair IS block uh, 
mechanism, um, <coughs> uh, phi, then student school pair IS block mechanism, psi. Okay? Um, so what am I doing here? I'm coming up with a way to say one mechanism has less envy than another mechanism. And that is a, a comparison that is a, uh, a problem by problem comparison. Okay? And I'm going to say if there's ever a blocking pair under one mechanism, that blocking pair has to be there uh, under the other mechanism. Okay? So this is a, a subset relationship. I'm, I'm looking at the set of blocking pairs. This is not a count of, of blocking pairs. Um, and uh, we can think about uh, a notion of having strictly less envy. So we'll say phi has strictly less envy than psi if um, phi has less envy than psi, but psi does not have uh, less envy than phi. Okay. And finally, we'll say that uh, phi uh, minimizes envy if there is no um, <coughs> mechanism psi that has strictly less envy uh, than phi. Okay. So this is an ordering that I'm proposing. And the reason I'm, I'm giving you this ordering uh, is for the following uh, result. Okay. So it's a, it's, partial. it's a partial ordering. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is actually related to some work you did with Dasgupta, I, I think. We should talk about that at some point, by the way, with your unanimity result. Yeah, and I'm going to come to another thing that's related to that. So yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that offline. So let me tell you about the result, okay? Um, uh, so here's the theorem. So suppose each school has one seat, okay? That is a very strong assumption, okay? And uh, something I'll talk about in just a second. Then if... Um, <coughs> Uh, phi is a Pareto efficient and strategy proof mechanism. Um, if phi has less envy than top trading cycles for a given set of priorities, then it must be the case that the outcome of phi and top trading cycles is the same. Okay, maybe put it in a more intuitive way, what this result tells us is that top trading cycles minimizes envy in the class of Pareto efficient and strategy proof mechanisms. Okay? And what you can show uh, is that Another natural mechanism, serial dictatorship, does not. Okay? So you can think of this as the dual of the Gale Shapley result. Right? Gale Shapley says deferred acceptance uh, is going to give me the most efficient uh, envy free, justified envy free allocation. This is saying in the special case where each school has one seat, top trading cycle is going to give me uh, the Pareto efficient allocation that minimizes uh, justified envy. Okay? Yep. Uh, we have a counter example. Um, let me tell you about that. Uh, let me jump to that question here, actually. So uh, for us to show this, we definitely need each school to have, have one seat. Uh, when you have uh, schools with more than one seat, like the models that we're motivated by, um, there, uh, there is no sharp characterization of the envy minimizing efficient mechanism. Uh, we know it, something has to exist uh, uh, because everything here is finite. Uh, but there's no natural characterization of that. You can say something if you make more assumptions. So if you think about uh, the random preference model that I just briefly mentioned, um, you can say a result that top trading cycles has, um, sorry, less justified envy than serial dictatorship. Um, uh, and if you actually look at the data uh, from cities uh, like Boston and, and New Orleans uh, and compare efficient allocations um, computed by top trading cycles and uh, serial dictatorship, you see that there's significantly less justified envy uh, from, uh, a serial uh, from a top trading cycles than a serial dictatorship. Um, <clears throat> and now we know, of course, um, deferred acceptance would have no justified envy, right? Uh, but it's not going to be Pareto efficient. Okay, so uh, this result, um, <clears throat> if we drop Pareto efficiency, we know we can find a way to minimize justified envy. So if instead we impose Pareto efficiency, there's a choice of mechanisms and you can use this result to say somehow TTC is uh, standing out in that class uh, of mechanisms. Okay. So let me now spend the last uh, 15 minutes or so talking about the fourth uh, important mechanism in this literature. Yeah, question. Of the students, correct, yeah. It, it would be if preferences are strict on both sides. So if preferences of schools, if for instance, some of the schools are ranking kids, like uh, say in New York City, about a third of the schools actually 
interview kids and uh, have them go through auditions or take specialized tests. But uh, the remaining are not ranking kids, uh, so there's some kind of indifference. You could say it's borough specific priority or, or sibling priority. Uh, in that model, if we thought of both sides, students and schools, it's not the case that deferred acceptance is Pareto efficient. Um, so that's just another sense in which as soon as we introduce some, no some form of indifferences, we have to be very careful about um, these properties. Right? But you're absolutely right. If we have strict preferences on both sides and we care about both sides, deferred acceptance is Pareto efficient. Okay. Okay, so let me spend the last couple minutes here now talking about the Boston mechanism. And um, I always like to show this picture uh, from Boston history whenever I talk about this mechanism because it goes to the question I think Ariel had asked about a second ago. Why do we have these priorities? Where does this come from? Okay. So, uh, you know, from those of you who are not from the U.S., this is a very iconic picture in American history. Uh, this is a picture from Government Center in, in Boston where um, uh, it, uh, there's a big protest in the uh, 70s in Boston. Uh, involving school assignment and this is not uh, unique to Boston but the situation was probably most tense in, in Boston <coughs> where uh, the courts uh, came in and said even though th um, um, <coughs> the law says you cannot have segregated schools the schools are de facto segregated so uh, we're going to introduce a form of busing where we're going to send minority children from neighborhoods like Roxbury into uh, uh, wider neighborhoods of South Boston and vice versa and the city uh, uh, reacted quite harshly to this. Uh, a lot of people left uh, Boston. And here is an individual about, who was uh, Ted Landsmark. He's uh, still in Boston, a famous character in Boston history, about to get impaled by the American flag. Um, and, um, you know, roughly speaking, the one group is in favor of neighborhood schools, schools close to where you live. Uh, another uh, group is in favor of uh, integration and uh, the expansion of choice to deal with inequities across uh, neighborhoods, okay? Um, and if we fast forward uh, to the <coughs> uh, 20 years after this picture was taken, the city of Boston came up with an assignment uh, plan that is known as the Boston Mechanism. Uh, and it's known as the Boston Mechanism in part because this is one of the few districts that actually publicize what their rules are, okay? so. Uh, the, you know, the history in Boston is so uh, layered and complex, the district has been quite transparent about what rules they're using. Uh, many places are not as transparent. What is the Boston mechanism? So the Boston mechanism uh, is also called the immediate acceptance uh, algorithm. Uh, and that's uh, to create a contrast with deferred acceptance. So in deferred acceptance, we defer everything until the very end. So I can displace Eric. Uh, even though I've ranked something 12th and Eric has ranked it first. Under this procedure, that you can't do that. Okay, so let me read to you how this works. In round one, we're only going to look at the first choices of students. We're uh, going to go to each school and consider the students who have ranked it first and assign students one at a time um, uh, according to the priority order until there's no seats left or there's no student left who's listed it as her first choice. Excuse me. Um, so if uh, Eric has applied to school first and he's a uh, high enough priority, he will be assigned to that school, okay? And he's immediately accepted, okay? In the generic round, in round K, we'll look at the students who are still not assigned and look at their Kth choices for each school with still available seats. Look at students who have ranked at Kth, assign them one at a time according to the priority order until there are no seats left or there is no student left who's listed as her Kth choice, okay? Uh, so this mechanism is putting a lot of weight on what schools you've ranked first. It's not going to be the case that I can displace Eric if I've ranked it 12th and he's ranked it first, even if I have the highest priority at that school. In this mechanism, the fact that he's ranked it first will trump any priority uh, that I have. And that creates this co complicated strategic uh, calculus that we need to think about. Um, should I rank a school first that uh, I may not get, maybe don't have a high enough priority for, or uh, if I do that, should I have a safe second choice? Perhaps I shouldn't even waste my first choice on that popular school um, and choose something that's a safe choice as my first choice. Um, so this is clearly not a strategy-proof mechanism. And this is something that is understood by uh, participants, at least some participants. Okay? Um, so here's an example of the kind of information that's given about this mechanism. So this is what Boston used to advertise to uh, families every year. 
when this mechanism was in place in their school brochure, for a better chance of your quote, first choice school, consider choosing less, less popular schools, okay? Uh, my favorite uh, um, story comes from the West Zone Parents Group. So this is a, an online Google group uh, at the time uh, that used to meet to discuss heuristics on ranking in, in uh, the Boston mechanism. So they're frequently asked questions in their introductory meeting minutes states one school choice strategy is to find a school you like that is undersubscribed and put it as a top choice or find a school that you like that is popular and put it as a first choice and find a school that is less popular for a quote safe second choice okay so this is a, a heuristic that um, uh, has emerged and you know broadly speaking there is I think evidence of some sophisticated behavior by by some players um, and unsophisticated uh, behavior by others. Lots of uh, um, uh, evidence in Boston, for instance, that uh, a substantial fraction of applicants have ranked two very popular schools as their first and second choice. That's not a great idea in this mechanism because if your first choice is very popular, um, you might not get it. But your second choice being very popular uh, means that it will have filled up with people who've listed it first, right? So if someone had that rank order list and knew that those schools were going to be heavily oversubscribed, it would be inadvisable to rank that second choice school as a very, uh, um, uh, if it's a very popular school. Yeah, question? But I thought these notions, well, they're prevalent also the, These kinds of uh, strategies? Well, deferred acceptance is a strategy proof mechanism. Yeah, but so in practice, you see these types of uh, Certainly not this kind of advice. So right now in Boston, for instance, they say, you should rank your schools uh, truthfully. It's the best you can do. It's, that's the quote is something like that. New York City has uh, similar uh, advice like that. There is a separate question, what do people understand, right? Uh, so that uh, is a point I, I certainly take. Um, um, and, um, you know, there's some lab evidence um, that people point to. There's also some survey evidence that even within strategy proof mechanisms, people may not understand that it's strategy proof. and. Uh, they may be using some heuristics that, that make no sense. But the appeal of a strategy-proof mechanism, at least you can give uh, clear advice that uh, you wouldn't be able to give uh, otherwise. Um, yeah, question. What, what is exactly the rationale for the Boston mechanism? So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a great question. Uh, we st I, th I still think this is the most popular assignment mechanism in the world. Um, I think this is a very intuitive idea. Let's try to give everyone their first choice, okay? Um, and, um, you know, in round one, look at first choices, try to assign first choices. That's where I think this comes from. This is from, you know, these aren't algorithm experts coming up with these schemes. These are district officials who uh, have come up with uh, this but scheme. It's not the case. Right, right. So why not, you know, it's not fair for me to displace Eric if I've ranked at 12th and he's ranked at first. Maybe Eric should get into that school. And what that's missing is that creates this kind of strategic uh, um, pressure on, on us to rank schools. Um, so I, I don't think it's that unnatural. Uh, well, it, yeah. it also can be efficient relative to the so Correct. That, that's another thing. I mean, we have to think about preferences being submitted, but for the submitted preferences, this will be an efficient outcome, um, whereas deferred acceptance uh, will not. Um, <clears throat> I have yet another rationale that I'm going to give you actually for why Boston may uh, continue to uh, uh, persist, okay? And that has to do with the political economy of having a manipulable mechanism, okay? So suppose we have players who are sophisticated and those who are not sophisticated. Um, one of the comments that the superintendent of Boston made about the debate uh, in the assignment mechanism that took place in the 2000s is the following. Now, superintendents don't talk like this, so this is definitely after a lot of interaction with the uh, people who study this, but he said the following point, which uh, I think resonates. Um, <clears throat> a strategy-proof mechanism levels the playing field between uh, those uh, <clears throat> by diminishing uh, the harm done to parents who do not strategize or do not strategize well. So he's kind of thinking about protecting the innocent uh, as a rationale. And so we can be a little bit more formal about that idea by considering a model where we have sophisticated and unsophisticated uh, players and we'll take this uh, premise that uh, the uh, sincere players so you can't call players unsophisticated when you're talking about public school families so that's an important lesson I learned when talking about this the sincere players uh, are restricted to only report their true preferences 
whereas we'll say the sophisticated players uh, best respond. Okay, so these are highly sophisticated uh, players. And uh, we're going to consider what happens in the game where you have these two types of players under the Boston mechanism and then uh, what happens under the deferred acceptance uh, algorithm. And let me just kind of get to the, the point uh, here. Uh, what you can show in this model uh, are the following three main kinds of results. Okay? Uh, the first is we can characterize the equilibrium outcomes of this Boston game in terms of an uh, economy where we take the priorities at schools and say any sincere student who's ranked at school second or lower is getting demoted in the priority ordering uh, relative to a sophisticated student. Okay? Um, so if I do this transformation and construct what we call the augmented economy where basically we demote sincere students at their second choice uh, and lower in the priority ordering and use the original priority ordering within uh, this uh, choices of students. Um, then um, the set of stable matchings of that augmented economy is equal to the set of Nash equilibrium outcomes of uh, this game. So the lesson that comes from that is, you know, because of this manipulation possibility of in the Boston mechanism, the sincere guys are effectively losing their priority to sophisticated guys at their second choice or lower. Okay? The second thing you can show in this model is if I focus on the assignment of a sophisticated student in the best Nash equilibrium, the Pareto dominant Nash equilibrium of this game, that's going to be at least as good as our assignment under the dominant strategy uh, equilibrium of deferred acceptance. So to El Anand's question, why would you have the Boston mechanism? What this result says, if we take the model uh, literally, is that sophisticated students uh, get some type of strategic rents from knowing how to manipulate or how to participate or game uh, the mechanism at the expense of sincere students. Okay? Uh, and so why uh, uh, do, do Boston type systems persist? Well, maybe some families have invested in learning how the mechanism works and they don't want to lose uh, that um, advantage that, that they get. Okay, so that's maybe another uh, story. You know, when, when the policy decision happened in Boston, the leader of the West Zone Parents Group, that, that quote I just gave, actually got up and made the claim, we shouldn't change the mechanism. We should give, us, give families more resources to make uh, more sophisticated choices. So that, that's consistent with that. Um, and so that, that's a, yet another reason. Now, this is a model, I think Nikhil is going to talk a little bit more about data and what we actually know about these issues. How uh, important is this trade-off between sophisticated and unsophisticated students? Exactly what are the welfare implications of uh, the Boston uh, mechanism? Is it really so bad uh, in practice? Um, let me spend, uh, so it's almost, I'm almost out of time. I want to talk about a couple more things because every time I think the literature on the Boston mechanism is uh, done, uh, there's a new place where something Boston-like uh, emerges. So here's a new setting uh, that uh, I stumbled upon a couple of years ago, where in Taiwan, they came up with a new assignment mechanism as part of their comprehensive uh, reform of their um, education system. Okay? And uh, uh, several articles came out in the local press documenting uh, major protests in the, uh, Taipei and other cities uh, with regards to the Taiwan mechanism. Okay, so uh, these protests, uh, so fortunately I'm working with a student on this project who can read the, uh, the Chinese language, I can. They're translated as fill out the school preference form for us. It's like gambling. Um, another protest is abolish the ranking uh, order deduction. So what is the Taiwan mechanism? So here's how this works and it's very much Boston-like. Um, in Taiwan, every child has to take an exam. Okay, they have a uh, uh, single exam, um, and uh, the officials in Taiwan came up with the following brilliant idea, you could say. Why don't we take the test scores of kids and modify the scores based on how the school is ranked, okay? Um, so if I scored 100 uh, on, a sc uh, on the exam, uh, we'll use my score of 100 for my first choice. For my second choice, I'm going to deduct 10 points from your test. So we're going to act as if your score was 90, okay? For my third choice, I'm going to deduct 20 points. So we'll act like your score is 80. Okay? Uh, so that's uh, this deduction schedule. So uh, in, you go on the, the websites in Taiwan. Uh, all of the 15 districts in Taiwan have different deduction rules. So in Taipei, it's just a one-point reduction. So my 100 becomes 99 for my second choice. My third choice becomes uh, 98. Um, and this is what they're protesting about. Okay? This becomes kind of complicated. 
Do I think about you know, using my, my high score for a school that I may not get into? Uh, if I don't, I'm going to face this deduction. I'm going to get taxed uh, for lower rank choices. And one thing that's neat about this is in the environment where there's no deduction, this is deferred acceptance, right? In the environment where we make the deduction very, very large, uh, this is the Boston mechanism, right? Because in the Boston mechanism, first choices always beat second choices, okay? Uh, so you can ask the question, and this is what we do, can we think about the properties of this mechanism, okay? Uh, in particular, um, <clears throat> you know, one thing we can show is um, if you deduct more points from uh, each uh, choice, the mechanism becomes uh, more manipulable, okay? It's, it becomes more gameable. And of course, in the limit, uh, this becomes the Boston mechanism. So the Boston mechanism is uh, uh, the most manipulable in this class of Taiwan mechanisms. Yeah. Did the students find out their test scores before or after they do the right? Uh, before, actually. So after they find it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, like so yeah. So in principle, you can do. This. As far as I know, uh, this has persisted for the last three years. They're still using this this mechanism in, in the field. Uh, you know, again. Uh, why do they do this? I don't know. This doesn't seem like a, a great idea. I mean, there is some sense in which um, it's complicated to rank choices. And I think some of these ideas is, uh, are used to simplify the ranking submission problem. Well, you could think of better ways to do that. Um, but here, they're making you think very hard about what schools uh, you actually rank because of this deduction. That could also be a rationale for the Boston mechanism. Um, Ali, you had a question. Yeah. I mean, we'd have to think about a richer model. I, I mean, the quick answer is, of course. Uh, the, we're only focusing here on just allocating people into you know, seats in a classroom. So if uh, we thought about the funding of those classrooms or um, um, you know, that comes a little bit to Ariel's question about where are these priorities coming from? What are the goals that we're trying to achieve in the background here? Um, then we'd think a, a bit more about um, these mechanisms. The one thing I will say is I think it's important to have a strategy proof mechanism at the heart of this and then tinker with those levers because by having a strategy proof mechanism we've maybe taken uh, some of the complexity off of the parents and we can ask these counterfactual questions and think about uh, these issues more clearly. Um, so priority design. I think one reason why Boston got rid of walk zone priority for instance uh, is now that they have a strategy proof mechanism they can actually understand what the consequences of different walk zone priorities uh, are, are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in it, it's a continuum now, right? Yeah. As uh, given by these deduction so points. Yeah, exactly. If you if you believe that Boston represents some kind of optimum, but you know I. Uh, do I really believe that? Uh, <laughs> I, I give you a rational for why it may exist. Uh, would I recommend the Boston mechanism? No, I wouldn't. Uh, in practice, right? So, uh, and just like here in Taiwan, if if the issue is we want to help people make a limited number of choices, I think there are many other instruments to do that than putting the strategic complexity uh, onto parents. Um, let me show you about one last thing, okay? Just, uh, and uh, this is another kind of amazing story, I think, uh, about this Boston idea. And this comes from the city of Chicago. So uh, here's an article from the Chicago Sun-Times uh, describing their admissions process to their um, elite college prep. So these are testing schools in the city of Chicago. Uh, they say high-scoring kids were being rejected simply because of the order in which they listed their college prep preferences. I couldn't believe it. It's terrible. Uh, CPS officials said Wednesday they've decided to let any eighth grader who applied to a school re-rank their preferences to better conform with the new selection system. Okay. Uh, previously, some eighth graders were listing the most competitive college preps as their top choice, foregoing their chances of getting into other schools that would have accepted them if they had ranked those schools higher. So hopefully by now you hear the word Boston mechanism in that paragraph, right? In the old Chicago system, uh, they said, we're going to look at test scores. And 
uh, first assign everyone their first choice, okay, um, and uh, continue uh, as much as possible till the school is uh, filled. Um, <clears throat> then only will we consider second choices. So it can happen that Eric gets into a school that he's ranked first over me, who's ranked at 12th, even though his score is a zero and mine is a perfect score, right, in this mechanism, right? And that's what they're saying is terrible, okay? So what the officials did in Chicago is they changed the system. Actually, 15,000 letters went out to students throughout the district, uh, and uh, they said, we're going to actually do a serial dictatorship where we uh, simply order students by the test score, the admissions exam. Whoever's got the highest score gets his first choice. Whoever's got the next highest choice gets his uh, first uh, top choice so on and so forth. And what's kind of unusual about the Chicago experience is in the old mechanism, you were allowed to rank uh, up to four schools out of eight in that first year. And they continue to do that restriction in the new mechanism. Okay? And so this is unusual because uh, I said a serial dictatorship has these very nice properties. Uh, when you restrict the number of schools you can rank, all those properties go away. So it's what's no... The, what's the rationale for doing that? Um, I think, you know, this is the thing we've been talking about. It's, there's some notion of complexity that we don't have like a formal language to talk about. Why didn't, like, you can leave it up to the parents how many they rank. They, uh, can, so they I, can rank them all or they can rank four or four. Yeah, I, so I've made that claim to Chicago after learning about this and they said, thank you, professor, that's very kind. <laughs> I didn't hear from them for another year and they said, okay, instead of having uh, four choices, we're going to allow you to rank six choices. <laughs> And what you can show, and I, I won't go into the details, is um, you know, neither of these mechanisms is strategy proof, but there is a formal sense in which this is less manipulable than this mechanism. Moreover, uh, this mechanism where you can rank four choices is more manipulable than the mechanism where you can rank six choices. Uh, and of course, we have the ideal strategy proof and efficient mechanism in this domain when there's no constraint uh, on the number uh, of choices. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what this is about here. Um, what I'm skipping also, just in the interest of time, and I'll wrap up, is uh, another case in which the Boston mechanism was condemned, and that happened in England. So we can talk about this at the break if you're interested. It turns out that in England, uh, they had independently discovered deferred acceptance in many uh, uh, regions, and uh, through an act of parliament in 2007, uh, they actually outlawed uh, the Boston mechanism uh, in par parliament. In England, they call it the first preferences first mechanism. And uh, most districts in England use what's called equal preferences, which is the Queen's English for deferred acceptance. Um, so, um, so we won't have time to talk about this. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we mentioned this a little bit, you know, we've seen that the Boston mechanism has been rejected in a number of places. You know, midstream in Chicago is banned by Parliament in England, yet it's still widespread. Why? Um, and one reason is uh, it's intuitive, another is a strategic rents idea. Uh, there's now a, an empirical literature that's trying to put some uh, quantitative magnitudes on uh, the trade-offs involved uh, in these mechanisms. And um, <clears throat> I think Nikhil is going to talk a little bit more about that. So let me wrap up with some of the things I wish I had time to tell you more about, um, which uh, are active areas uh, in matching theory. So one thing I'm particularly interested in is actually related to Ariel's question, where do these priorities come from? What are good priorities? How, does, how do these relate to kind of broader aspects of the market, kind of as Ali was, was saying? So um, <coughs> that's particularly germane in debates about affirmative action policies. So uh, if you guys looked at the New York Times this morning, the Trump administration offered some guidance that uh, uh, says you, can, you cannot use uh, um, explicit racial criteria in K through 12 public uh, school admissions. Uh, there's always this back and forth on what's exactly allowable. So several districts have experimented with kind of race neutral alternatives to, to race based affirmative action. There's a host of very interesting issues to, to study there. Uh, other directions where things are quite active involve pushing the limits of deferred acceptance, thinking about incorporating prices into deferred acceptance, um, static versus dynamic models. So Nikhil will talk a bit about kidney exchange. That's a place where dynamics are quite important. Uh, and uh, this literature is uh, often inspired by very practical applications. Um, so that's something that um, continues. Uh, one of the most exciting uh, domains people are working on now involve refugee assignment okay, and issues related to ways refugees get placed into different countries and within countries. Okay, thank you for giving me a couple extra minutes. Let me stop here. Um, and I can take questions at the break. <laughs>